Hi guys, it's Scott here again. Welcome to the third and final video in this series of joining methods. In this video we're going to take a look at threaded and non-threaded fasteners. Starting first with threaded fasteners, the most common form of threaded fasteners is what we call a bolt. So a bolt has um, very particular features. We have a head uh, shown here at the bottom, we have a parallel shank, which is this bit here, which doesn't have a thread on it. And then we have a length of thread above that. And so these are the three features of a bolt. If, for instance, we have a bolt, but it doesn't have this parallel section here, that's what we call a screw. So if you're dealing with tradespeople and you want to be specific, um, keep in mind the differences between the bolt with this parallel section with no thread and the screw which is threaded all the way down to the head. There's another type of bolt which is double-ended and we call these studs. So a stud is a rod with threads on both ends, it can be an even amount of thread or a different amount of thread and typically they have um, a bit of parallel shank in the middle where there is no thread to separate these two sides and we commonly use those in uh, things like engines to secure our cylinder heads. If we don't want to be taking um, bolts in and out of something soft like aluminium, maybe we'd put a stud in it like this so that this end stays in permanently. We put the head on and then we can secure that down uh, with nuts rather than removing the bolts from the aluminium all the time. The heads on our bolts and screws may be uh, many different shapes. Most common, of course, is the hexagon, but we can also have square shapes like this one shown here. Socket heads, cheese heads, countersunk or round. This is a socket head, and we might tighten up this bolt by using an Allen key, and there's different types of keys, um, including Allen and Torx, that we could use. A cheese head uh, looks a little bit like this. It's shaped uh, like a big wheel of cheese. In this case, we've got a single slot across the top for a screwdriver, a flat screwdriver. We may have countersunk heads and so these have a conical taper on the underside of the heads and usually we make matching holes for these uh, style of bolts to sit into so that the top surface here is flush and so it's less likely to catch on things, um, better for aerodynamic drag if we're designing aeroplanes and race cars. This particular example here has um, a cross screwdriver head, commonly called a Phillips head, um, in that, but it can have different types, such as Allen heads in there as well. Uh, this is an example of a round-headed screw shown side on. And the nuts that we use uh, to work with these bolts uh, are typically hexagon or square. So that's a typical hexagon nut. That's a typical square nut shown there. And there are also some novel type of nuts. This one here has uh, these bits poking out on the side so that you can tighten them up or loosen them with your fingers and this is commonly called a wing nut and if you're in Australia and you have ears that are very big or stick out from the side of your head people might call you wing nut. In applications where it's very important that our fasteners, our nuts and bolts don't come, come undone we have a variety of techniques to ensuring that they stay done up. So for things like cars and um, aircraft in particular we really want to make sure that these threads are not going to vibrate loose because all that's really holding them together is friction when we tighten them up. So there are a number of ways that we can do this. We can increase friction with uh, a lock nut, we can use plastic deformation, spring washers, deformed nuts, elastomers, etc. So let's look at some of these examples. So the first one here is um, a lock nut. So we have what we call a rod end here. It's a special type of bearing and it has uh, like a bolt thread on the end of it which we might want to screw into something. Now to stop this uh, turning, this part here turning and coming loose or changing the adjustment, we put on an additional nut which is this one here and sometimes these are quite thin like the one shown here and then we tighten this nut up hard against this other component here and so that increases the friction on the threads and helps prevent uh, this coming undone it doesn't guarantee it but it, it makes it less likely if we need a more um, reliable solution we can actually buy nuts that we def plastically deform to ensure that they um, don't come undone. So this might be on the end of uh, the crank on a car engine. So we put this big nut on and 
the shaft that we're screwing it onto has got these slots cut in it and then we're using a hammer and a chisel we hammer in um, these deformable sides of the nut so we form that in there so that this can't come undone easily to get this off we'd actually have to hammer that out again and clear clear that gap so that we can unscrew the nut here is an example of a spring washer so this is a square or a rectangular cross section of um, high tensile steel and cut off into small pieces like this. So there's a curl in it and a sharp edge. And as we tighten down the, the nut or the bolt onto this spring washer, it's going to elastically deform until it compresses up flat. And then when we come to unscrew it in the anti-clockwise direction, these sharp edges are going to gouge into the underside of our nut or our bolt and try and prevent this coming undone. We can overpower that, but it should be enough to prevent it from unscrewing due to vibration. Here is a special type of nut which we call a deformed nut. So on the end of this end of the nut, it actually goes down to a smaller cross section which is circular and it's got these little slots um, that are cut out. And then this nut is actually plastically deformed to bend in um, these ends of the nut so that when we uh, put it onto uh, the bolt or the component that we're tightening up, as the bolt comes through, it has to elastically deform um, these bent bits outwards which increases that friction and generally stops the nut from coming undone unless we are applying a big torque to it. This is a particular brand and style of nut commonly called a nylock and what has been done to this nut is it has a piece of nylon that has been rolled into the nut using a cold process and then as the nut is tightened down onto the bolt the bolt coming through is actually bigger diameter than this piece of nylon and then that actually cuts into the nylon and deforms it and increases the, the friction here to prevent the nut from coming undone and typically we can only use um, these type of nuts once after we've used them and taken them on and off once we would throw them away because we might have um, damaged that nylon in there permanently and so it won't grip quite as hard the next time we use it. Another way to ensure that our nuts and bolts don't come undone, aside from increasing the friction, is to provide a separate locking component um, to secure the nut. So let's look at some of the examples of that. This is, this is an example that you'll see commonly on aircraft and race cars. It's called lock wire. So what we actually do is we drill some small holes through the bolt or the nut and then we thread wire through those holes and then if we wrap it around in the correct direction and take it to another nut that we also want to keep tight um, we can actually twist this piece of wire up so that it's nice and taut and that way if the nut or the bolt starts to come undone then it'll actually pull on this wire tightening um, the other nut or bolt at the same time and, and this will ensure that they um, can't come undone and to get this off we have to cut it off um, before we can actually unscrew the nut or the bolt. Uh, so this is a very, very reliable and light way of providing a locking mechanism, but it is a little bit fiddly and takes a bit of extra time to implement. Another option more commonly used on automotive applications where we don't want things to come undone is a deformable tab washer. So we have a bolt or a stud coming through here and we've got a nut there and then we've got this um, kind of right angle shaped washer one end of it is folded down around this edge so that can't rotate and the other end after we've tightened up our nut we actually hammer up this side so that it sits flush against one of the flat sides of the nut so that this is preventing it um, from coming undone. To actually get this nut off then we'd have to bend down this tab again before we were able to rotate that nut and undo it. So that's a deformable tab washer. Final option here is what we call a castellated nut and a cotter pin. If we take our nut and we cut out some slots like you see across here and we put a matching hole in the shaft then we can tighten up our nut to the required position and then when it overlaps with uh, one of these holes and sometimes we can have multiple holes here so we can have fine adjustment of the tension on this nut when they line up then we put this pin through here and we fold over the legs of the pin and this will ensure that this uh, nut can't come undone until we take the pin out and so this is something that you would commonly see on uh, the axles of your car if you pull off the dust covers and you look at the hubs then this is generally how all, you, all of your wheel bearings on your car are held in place.
Just a comment here, bolts and screws are made in a whole lot of standard diameters and lengths and we have um, tables of that available. So when you're designing something, make sure that you're using a uh, common size that you can um, buy easily and you're not designing um, specialized bolts and nuts that have to be um, custom made because they'll cost a lot more. Let's take a look now at some non-threaded removable fasteners. So there are a variety of different types of pins that we can use and they all have slightly different design features. The first one shown here is a dowel pin and these are hardened steel and they're parallel and commonly have domed ends because we um, usually like to hammer them into uh, things that we're fixing together. An example shown here, we've got a shaft here and we want to join it to this um, wheel say on the outside and we might do that by drilling a hole through the shaft or a slot and then hammering in one of these dowel pins. To get this pin to stay in place so that it doesn't fall out either side we're going to need an interference fit with this outer wheel flange so we have to be very accurate in our um, tolerance on this hole to ensure that we get the correct interference fit. An interference fit is where this pin is actually bigger in diameter than the hole that we're putting it into so we might need to use a little bit of force, a press or maybe a hammer to ensure that we get this um, pin um, all the way home. A slightly cheaper way to do that is to rather than use a parallel pin like this dowel over here is to use a taper pin and so we can use a cheaper manufacturing technique to create a matching tapered hole using a ream in this part and then we can hammer this in until it jams up in the, the matching tapered hole here. So that's maybe a slightly cheaper method um, that we can consider using tapered pins. It's also good for removing any slop um, in the shaft as well as um, the pin to the hub. Here is a third pin option and we call this a roll pin. You may be able to make out there that this pin is not solid but is actually a flat piece of steel that has been rolled up into a circular shape and it doesn't actually touch or, or join over here and so we can actually get a pin of a diameter, a roll pin of a diameter that's slightly bigger than the hole that we want to force it into and as we hammer that in then this will compress up elastically and provide friction to stop it from coming out. So obviously um, that's going to be a lot easier and we can put these into drilled holes which is cheaper but they're not going to be as strong as a similar solid taper or dowel pin. The fourth option we have here is a cotter pin. So this um, particular style of pin is formed by folding a D-shaped cross section bit of steel uh, typically and it's folded around in a loop and then back through so that this final cross section here is circular. We can then put that through our hole to join our components together and quite often the legs are different lengths that allows you to, to grip this one separately and bend it backwards and then bend the other one so that this pin can't be removed until um, it's been straightened out again. So that holds everything together. That's a cotter pin. Keys are another way of um, particularly transmitting torque between shafts and hubs that we might be designing. So here is a particular style and shape of key. It's a semicircular shape and that goes into this matching semicircular shape here. Um, we've looked at this in previous examples and this is what we call a Woodruff key. They come in particular sizes and those sizes match the shape of the cutting tool that is used um, to cut out the slot. So they're numbered. We can also have um, parallel keys. So this is like a rectangular um, section of steel that we would cut a slot into our shaft and then have a matching slot in this hub. And if we insert this key in between the two, that will uh, enable the transmission of torque. We can also use um, clips for a variety of joining needs. Commonly they're going to be thin and elastic and we can use them to retain components. This is something that might be used to retain say the wheels on a model car. Uh, it's going to be flexible due to these slots that are cut out here and so if we push that onto the shaft um, these will bend elastically and then also the sharp edges will grip into the shaft. So that can be used for taking quite light um, axial loads on things that we're trying to join together. If we need to take higher loads, um, then we can use uh, these, which are called circlips. 
Now these circlips come in both internal and external varieties. This big one here is an external and you can tell it's an external circlip by the fact that it has these little tabs here on the outside of the circlip so that when we get our very special circlip pliers we can put the circlip pliers into these two holes and using the pliers we can open up this circlip, flex it open and then put it over a shaft and there'll be a matching slot that we would cut that this will then sit into and this is a common method used to retain bearings. Uh, the other alternative here is an internal circlip, so this one has these tabs on the inside here and so we use a different type of plier that then pulls these together and this allows us to put the circlip inside um, a hole and then that also will allow it to jump out again to a bigger diameter to sit in um, a machine slot that we might have there. So those are circlips. If we really need to transmit a lot of torque and we're going above um, the capability of what a key might be able to provide or a pin, then we use what we call a spline um, to transmit this torque. So a spline basically acts like a whole lot of keys acting simultaneously around the diameter of our shaft and we have matching um, slots or splines um, on this other part and these slide together and they're an extremely effective and efficient way of transmitting torque. However, because of the amount of machining required, they're typically more expensive to manufacture and so we only use them uh, when we really need them, commonly in applications like gearboxes or differentials on your car. The final way that we can fasten parts together uh, without using uh, threaded fasteners is through an interference fit on its own. If we're joining parts with quite big interference fits or in very um, strong and stiff materials like steel, we may have to use a hot cold process where we heat up um, the outside part and freeze the inside part to help us get them together. We can also use presses and, and hammers to, to actually fit them together. A good example of an interference fit that uh, most students will be familiar with is the champagne cork in a champagne bottle. So that's held there just by the fact that this cork is um, has been elastically deformed and the friction is holding it in there. And so that's a really good example of an interference fit. And on that celebratory note, I'll conclude this video and thank you for watching.